Welcome uh, to all of you joining here uh, in person at the Wisconsin Energy Institute or joining online uh, through Zoom. Um, this is your first time joining us for our Sustainable Energy Seminar. My name is Scott Williams. I'm the Research and Education Coordinator at the Wisconsin Energy Institute. And the Sustainable Energy Seminar Series is something we do every other week here at the Wisconsin Energy Institute uh, to bring together uh, experts uh, from the social sciences and humanities to science and engineering uh, to talk about the many different ways that uh, uh, researchers here at UW-Madison understand energy challenges and develop uh, sustainable solutions. Um, this is uh, not only open to the public, but a, a course for students in the Certificate for Engineering for Energy Sustainability, as well as the Master's in Sustainable Systems Engineering. Uh, if you have a question online, uh, you can use the chat or the uh, Q&A. Uh, I'll be monitoring that. Um, and um, there is live captioning available. Uh, if you want, you can click on the, the show captions button in Zoom uh, to, um, to enable that feature. Um, so with that, I'll uh, introduce our uh, speaker for today. Uh, Eric Kazak is an assistant professor in mechanical engineering. Um, and his uh, research group uh, is based uh, here at UW-Madison. Um, they're, they're looking at the challenges of the intersection of energy, material science, and sustainability. So they're looking at uh, new materials, um, and understanding uh, scalable, sustainable processing methods um, in areas such as batteries, advanced structural materials, additive manufacturing, and catalysis. And so he's going to be uh, speaking more about uh, this area as it relates to uh, advanced batteries. So welcome. All right. Thanks, Scott, for that introduction. As he said, my name is Eric Kazak. I'm an assistant professor in mechanical engineering. I joined UW-Madison last fall, so starting from August. I've been here building my research group. Uh, today, I'm going to talk mostly about batteries. I'm going to talk about some of the places where things other than batteries maybe have an important role to play in energy storage, moving towards a more sustainable society, especially as it pertains to how we use energy. Um, and my background is, so I started my life, I grew up in Maryland on the East Coast, and then I did my undergraduate work there at the University of Maryland in mechanical engineering, and then did all of my graduate studies at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And kind of over the last decade or so, my research has mostly focused around energy storage, in particular, various types of batteries. So I've done a lot of work in lithium ion batteries, solid state electrolytes, which I'll introduce and talk more about how solid state batteries have some unique properties and some exciting advantages as it pertains particularly to electric vehicles and the transportation sector. Uh, a lot of experience with advanced material characterization, including how we can characterize materials and devices while they're operating to really learn what's going on inside of them, figure out how to make them better. And then uh, a big focus on what's going on at the interfaces in these electrochemical energy storage systems. So today, my talk's going to cover, hopefully answer, uh, a few different questions. The first is, why do we care about batteries? The second is, well, if we care about batteries, how do they work? Third, I'm going to do kind of a deep dive in one area of my former research that I think is particularly relevant to today's uh, kind of uh, discussion in, in the zeitgeist, so to speak, around vehicle electrification, and that is how can we enable fast charging? Because people really care about if they pull up to an electric vehicle charger, how long does it take to add that range back, right? We can't be sitting there for two hours while our vehicle charges if we're on a road trip. That's okay if you're just commuting day to day, but fast charging is really important, as we'll talk about. And then we'll look ahead at what's kind of on the horizon. What are some of the next generation technologies that might have a, a role to play as it pertains to energy storage and sustainability? Um, there's some audio issues. Um, fortunately, there's not a whole lot we can do right now. Um, getting on the uh, I think the best thing might be to maybe lower. Just a little bit, but unfortunately, there's not a whole lot. Okay. Well, hopefully, it's not too intolerable. 
online. Um, the two kind of next generation technologies that I'm going to touch on specifically would be solid state batteries. So how those can enable higher energy densities and improve safety for particularly transportation applications. And then two different long duration energy storage uh, battery chemistries, namely air batteries and flow batteries. And then I'll open up the floor for questions at the end. Hopefully I'll save quite a bit of time for that. So we'll jump right in. Why do we care about batteries? Well, I always like to start my talks on energy storage here. This shows a general flow of how we in the US use energy and how and where it comes from, how we're generating that energy. And I want to point out just a couple of things. I could spend the whole talk just on this slide, probably just teasing out some intricacies, but there's a couple of things that I want to point out here. First is that we're seeing the a real uptick in the uh, how widespread intermittent renewables, in particular solar and wind, are in our electricity generation in this country and around the world. And what that means is as we want to further increase the penetration of these intermittent renewables, we need to integrate more storage into the energy grid to account for the fact that the sun's not always shining and the wind's not always blowing. And in particular, the sun's not always, sh always shining when we're using the most electricity. Um, so in order to uh, compensate for that and enable our uh, grid to handle various changes in demand and supply, we need to integrate more energy storage. Now, the second piece that I want to point out is if we look at the transportation sector, currently it's dominated by petroleum. And the need for energy storage here is that we want to be able to transfer electrical energy that we can generate from ideally sometime in the very near future dominantly from these intermittent renewable sources and use that for the transportation sector. So that's vehicle electrification. So it's really these two main areas, the transportation sector and enabling larger or widespread implementation of these intermittent renewable sources on our grid, because together those two things represent over half of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. All right, so first we're gonna talk about that transportation sector. And as I see it, there's at least these three, three options for uh, transitioning to a more sustainable transportation sector. The first one that I'm going to talk about here is everybody's aware that battery electric vehicles, the Teslas of the world, are the most widely commercialized option in this space. This is a battery electric vehicle. So you have an electric chemical energy storage system on board. You can charge that with however you want to generate electricity, and then it provides that power on demand. Kind of a, a somewhat similar uh, technology would be fuel cells. And fuel cells electrochemically combine some type of fuel, it's often hydrogen, with oxygen species in a controlled manner such that you generate electricity and uh, gaseous byproducts that can be easily disposed of. Uh, in the case of a hydrogen fuel cell, that's just water. To this point, uh, fuel cell, at least for consumer level electric vehicles have been limited by concerns with the production, transportation and storage of hydrogen in an economical way. The demand for precious metal catalysts in many cases, uh, whether that's for generating or using uh, the hydrogen and an overall system energy efficiency that's lower than what can be attained for battery EVs. Battery EVs could be upwards of 90% system level energy efficiency, where if you take into account generating the hydrogen, transporting it, running it through a fuel cell, charging a battery because fuel cells are more of a steady state operation, uh, and then discharging that battery, it's more on the order of maybe 30 to 50%, depending on exactly what you're doing there. So for the same driving distance that you want to cover, you'd need roughly double the uh, grid capacity of wind and solar and those intermittent renewables to cover the same range. The third one here that I want to mention is biofuels. So there's a lot of very interesting prospects in this space, but currently the technologically mature options like corn ethanol have a pretty low energy return on investment. So the higher energy return on investment options aren't quite there technologically. So as I see it, both Fuel cells on the left and biofuels on the right, they have a very significant role to play, but for consumer uh, electric vehicles at the moment, 
battery electric vehicles are probably the best option in the near term. And the other two are probably best suited for things that are very hard to shift to batteries, things like uh, aviation, shipping, heavy duty machinery, things like that. Yeah. I don't realize this. Yes. Yes. I don't happen to know what. Yeah. So, and that's an example. The the. Diesel fuels, I think, are, are a, a great prospect in many ways. I mean, you can turn algae into to fu diesel fuel fairly readily now. Um, very good for heavy commercial applications, I would say. Um, and I think at the moment, my opinion may change, but at the moment, I think it's better suited for those applications, the heavy-duty commercial applications, where it's, it's much harder to use a battery in that application. But yeah, no, I, I'm very much all of the above, but God asked me to talk about batteries. So yeah, no, 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 I understand. Yeah, no, but thank you for the question. Okay, so why have battery EVs kind of risen to the forefront in this consumer space? It's largely been driven by the precipitous decline in cost over the last decade. So from 2010, we were over $1,000 per kilowatt hour per pack level. And in 2020, Come on, we were down around $130 per kilowatt hour. So a 90% decline in 10 years, really impressive drop in price, largely driven by uh, just scale, increasing scale of production. But in very recent years, so this plot now comes up to 2022, we've seen a really steep incline in the price of lithium carbonate, which is the primary precursor for lithium-based materials inside of lithium ion batteries. And this increase in the price of lithium feedstock is now starting to affect the price of lithium ion battery packs, right? Just a little uptick, right? 141 to 151 here, but you can see the pack level. So the peripherals, how good we are at putting these materials into a battery still got better, 33 to 31, but the price of the materials down here in the cell starts to go up. And actually, if you zoom in, in time and the price of lithium, at one point there was a 15 fold increase over the, the course of a couple of months. So that volatility in the price of lithium is a real problem as we start to move forward. The scale of vehicle electrification is only increasing. That supply demand imbalance is only gonna get worse in the near term. In addition, where we're producing these lithium ion batteries is not uh, geographically evenly distributed, right? Over 90% of the, the batteries are being made in China currently, and it really doesn't make sense from certainly an energy security standpoint. There's uh, geopolitical consequences to this, but more fundamentally, there's a sustainability problem with this because we're shipping lithium and cobalt and nickel all around the world and copper all around the world because we're making all our batteries in China, but we're not using all our batteries in China, and all of the lithium and the cobalt and nickel is not being produced in China. So there's a little big push to diversify the supply chain. I'm not gonna go into this. Just know that that's, I mean, a very hot topic, very important thing in my mind. But this sets the kind of landscape that we're in for battery related research and development as I see it. First of all, we need our batteries to justify the cost, right? The cost is probably plateaued or maybe even increasing. So there's other areas where we can increase. Can we make them last a really long time? So maybe the battery outlives the car and you can just put the same battery in multiple cars over time. I'm just throwing ideas out there. Can we increase the range to the point that that's a game changer for some people? Can we decrease charging time? Can we improve safety in meaningful ways? Also, for anything where the size and weight doesn't matter, so lithium really shines in size and weight, for anything that, that doesn't matter, stationary applications, grid storage, we really need to be looking away from lithium-based batteries in those cases. And we need to be taking into account from the outset, how am I going to dispose of these batteries? Can I recycle the materials that are inside? I should be doing life cycle analyses to take into account all of the embodied energy and all of these things. Designing for end of life is a really important consideration here as well. 
So to kind of dive in a little deeper, I'm gonna address a few different challenges related to battery energy storage, kind of ranging from immediate near-term stuff like fast charging and safety, all the way to kind of next generation technologies that are looking at using more earth abundant materials and trying to take into account all of the uh, systemic impacts, social justice concerns and resource extraction, all of that all the way through materials, science and cell design, um, connections with infrastructure, all of this. All right, so first we're gonna talk about fast charging. How important is fast charging? Well, to illustrate this point, I'm going to consider two cars, a red car and a blue car. We're gonna drive from where I was previously at the University of Michigan to here in Madison. This is a little under a 400 mile journey. And the red car here has a 170 mile range, but can charge in 12 minutes. The blue car has double the range, 340 miles, and it charges more slowly, an hour charge. So that's more, more comparable to many of the EVs on the road currently. I've included a bit of a buffer. So the 175, 170 mile range EV, uh, you only really feel comfortable maybe driving 130 of that because you don't wanna run it all the way down to zero before you recharge. Same thing for the blue car, five minute ramp on and off, 70 mile per hour cruising speed. And I'm assuming critically that there's infrastructure along this path. In this case, it, it's actually quite accurate. There's plenty of DC fast chargers along this particular route. It's almost entirely interstates through uh, densely populated enough regions for there to be uh, chargers. But which one gets there first? Well, the red one, I'd have to make two charging stops and it would take a little over six hours to get there. The blue car, despite the fact that it had double the range, would take 15 minutes longer, 16 minutes longer. So this kind of illustrates you can compensate for range limitations with fast charging. And keep in mind that battery in the red car is half the size. It uses half the materials. It probably costs maybe a little bit more than half, but roughly half. Um, but it still gets you where you need to go, right? And for a day-to-day -day commuting situation, 170 miles range is plenty for pretty much everybody that's uh, commuting daily. So this hopefully illustrates how important fast charging is for enabling widespread implementation of electric vehicles. All right, so now we're hopefully convinced fast charging is really important. In order to get to how we're enabling fast charging, I first wanna take a step back and make sure everybody's on the same page when it comes to how a rechargeable battery works. And I'm an analogy person, so I'm gonna use an analogy. So here I have two tanks of water, they're sealed and they're at different elevation, right? H represents the difference in height between the surfaces of the water. So what's gonna happen if I open this valve? You'd think so, but remember I said the tanks were sealed. So there's air above the water. So there's air in this trap space and that won't let the water flow downhill, right? But if I create another pipe with a valve that lets the air go back and forth as well, now if I open this valve, now we can discharge, right? Now the water can flow downhill. Struggling, here we go. And then if I wanted to move the water back uphill, of course I could pump the water directly, but I could also pump the air, right? I could put a pump on the air line, pump water downhill in this case, right? And the water would flow back uphill to make room for the pressurized air, right? So this is similar to how a lithium ion battery in a lithium ion battery, similarly, we have two reservoirs. In this case, it's reservoirs for lithium. So on the left side here over those green tetrahedra are a crystal structure of a metal oxide. And you can have lithium in that crystal structure and it's nice and happy because it's got oxygen around it. Um, lithium really doesn't like to, get to be in the metallic state, so it's nice and satisfied with its oxygen. But if we apply a voltage external, we can drive electrons through the external circuit and that forces lithium ions across the cell. So as this plays, you see electrons going through the external circuit, lithium ions going through the middle across an ionically conductive electrolyte and reuniting with the electrons over here. Inside of this is graphite, this layered structure. The lithium really doesn't want to be there very much. It's almost in the metallic state. Um, so the voltage of that 
is different, right? So voltage is a way to think about potential or the energy level. So there's an energy difference between these two sides. And by allowing the, the ions to then flow back, right? So we're about to start the discharge, right? We go from a high energy level to a low energy level. The electrons are forced through the external circuit and they can do useful work in that process. So if we go back to our analogy here, now the difference in height is analogous to the voltage, the difference in the energy level of the two electrodes inside of our battery. The size of the water reservoirs represent the capacity of our battery, how much lithium we can store in the case of a lithium ion battery. Come on. The air represents the electrical current, that external circuit, and the total amount of energy we can store is the voltage times the capacity of that product. Product, And just kind of from a practical uh, consideration, the choice of electrode materials, that dictates our voltage. We can increase the size of our electrodes, that's the capacity. But the materials have to be compatible. You can't just pick any two materials that have exactly the properties you want and be confident that they're going to get along, so to speak. And this process of charging and discharging can't irreversibly damage the materials that are involved. So how do we actually make this work? What does it look like in actuality? Well, first we mix active materials, particles of our electrode materials in a liquid. We create essentially a thick paint and we paint that onto a metallic current collector. In the case of graphite that goes on copper, the positive electrode in a lithium ion battery goes on aluminum. Then we punch out different size sheets of these two electrode materials. And then we stack layers of those two electrodes together with a separator and electrolyte in between, and it creates a stack that looks something like this. On the left, that would be like a pouch side, a cell style battery. On the right, this is like a jelly roll. This is a cylindrical style battery, like a double A form factor, right? And if we zoom in uh, even more with an electron microscope, this is kind of what that looks like. And if we go back to schematic, now you understand where my schematic comes from. And this is what we have. So we have a graphite electrode, that's our, high energy state, and then we have some mixed metal oxide. Doesn't matter for this purpose of this talk exactly what those materials are, but often they have nickel and cobalt in them, which can be problematic for supply chain reasons. But this gets us to the current state of the art, where we have a pretty good volumetric energy density compared to everything that came before lithium. Uh, something like 500 watt hours per liter is really good these days. 250 watt hours per kilogram, so it'd be gravimetric energy density. One of the key things about lithium ion batteries is this Coulombic efficiency. You can cycle this thing back and forth over and over and over and over again, many times, more than a thousand times in many cases, because there aren't any irreversible, there's not much irreversible uh, side reactions going on at either electrode in these optimized systems. Cost we already talked about, but critically, we're still limited. Some cells in, in like Hyundai is really good at fast charging compared to the rest of the field right now, and Tesla's pretty good, but still 30 minutes, four hours, somewhere, somewhere in there for a full charge is pretty good. So what's actually limiting that process, right? What's limiting fast charging performance? Well, during the first charge, what happens is we start putting lithium into this graphite electrode where it really doesn't want to go. The energy level starts going up, right? So on this energy scale over there, it starts going up. And at some point, the electrons inside of this graphite are so unhappy that they can actually jump from the graphite into the electrolyte, decompose the electrolyte, and that forms what we call the solid electrolyte interphase, or SEI, this blue ring around the graphite. This SEI is an ionic conductor, but an electronic insulator, so it prevents those electrons from continuing to hop into the electrolyte, and this passivates the surface of the electrode and enables that thousand cycle, cycle life. Uh, this was somewhat of a serendipitous discovery. It's uh, happens by accident almost inside of the cell. This is the secret sauce that goes on inside a lot of battery manufacturing plants today. They won't tell you exactly what they do to form the best SEI or what chemicals they put in the electrolyte in very minute quantities to form the best SEI, but this is absolutely critical. All right, but when I want a fast charge, so this is kind of the starting point for fast charging, but if I want a fast charge, I have these lithium ions that are hanging out in the liquid electrolyte, and I start driving current across this electrolyte really fast. What happens is you get a concentration gradient through the thickness and across the cell. 
right? So the concentration of lithium ions at the electrolyte separator interface is higher than deep within the graphite electrode. And as a result of that, you get current focusing near the surface of the electrode here. So these green circles pile up at the, the surface of the electrode there. And eventually, they get so unhappy inside of the graphite, because all the slots are filled, essentially, you plate out lithium metal, that metallic lithium. And metallic lithium is extremely reactive towards most things, including the liquid electrolyte. So you continue to grow those metallic filaments. You form SEI on the surface of that, that uh, metallic lithium, which consumes lithium from your active reservoir. And you can't strip it all back. You get what's called dead lithium. And that piles up on the surface of your electrode and essentially kills your battery. So you don't want this to happen. So all our EVs are essentially controlling the charging rate to avoid this happening. This is why you can charge faster at low state of charge, but then you have to taper off towards the end because you're approaching the potential or the energy level of this metallic lithium. So you can't drive the cell as hard when you get closer to this end point. Okay. All right. So what does this look like in real life? It looks something like this, where as we start charging our battery, this is at 60, so this is a 10 minute charge. Graphite has a nice property where it changes colors as you put lithium in it. So you can actually visually see state of charge in graphite. So these gold particles are now fully lithiated. But at a certain point, and in this controlled cell, we can actually measure how close to the potential of metallic lithium or lithium lithium plus we are in this case. So we're actually below that potential, which means we can plate out lithium metal. And as we proceed, you indeed see these kind of silver, silvery gray deposits of lithium metal accumulate on the surface of the graphite. So this is what we want to prevent. So how can we do this faster? How can we prevent the lithium from piling up? Well, I said I like analogies. This is one from where I grew up near the Chesapeake Bay. So any toll, if you want to get a lot of cars, the cars are the ions in this situation. If you want to get it, a lot of cars, through a restriction, in this case a toll, what are your options? Well, two options that I come up with are you can open more lanes, right? You can make the whole toll plaza wider, have more places for the ions, the cars to go through, or you can come up with easy pass. You can streamline the process, right? So I'm going to talk about two approaches that uh, myself and my former group at Michigan came up with to enable fast charging. But before we do that, I want to make one side note on how fast is fast enough, right? Do we actually need to get to the point where charging our Tesla or whatever your choice of EV is only takes the three minutes that it takes to refuel gas? Is that where we want to get to? And kind of for first cut, yes, like we want to be competitive, right? We want, don't want any downside. But actually, as I think about it, we don't want to go that far because take a 100 kilowatt hour uh, battery EV, so a long range, uh, 300 mile range EV. If you wanted to charge it in six minutes, so twice the time that I just talked about, that's a 10 C rate is how we talk about that. But that means we need one megawatt of power to charge that EV in six minutes. Three minutes, you need two megawatts. One megawatt is about 20 times the power that a normal home electricity connection has. So two megawatts is 40 times. Unfeasible in most places, right? Only at like an electrical substation, you're gonna have that level of power pretty much available to you. So in my mind, 10 to 15 minutes is kind of the crossover point where you start shifting the majority of the challenges from the battery over to the infrastructure. So that 10 minute is a, a good, good target in my mind, all right? So the two approaches here are creating more lanes is structuring the electrode. So we're gonna cut ion transport channels into our porous graphite electrode to help the ions get deeper in the electrode more quickly. And then our easy pass for lithium ions is an artificial SEI coating. So a better version of that serendipitously formed uh, shell on the graphite that'll help us get the ions in and out more quickly. All right, so we use a UV laser in this case, it's roll-to-roll -roll compatible, uh, pretty low cost. There's actually a, a startup company that we spun out that's trying to make this happen for actual batteries, but we're using a UV laser to cut many, many of these little holes 
that in theory should let the lithium ions go in faster. But does it? Well, the control, if you try to charge in 15 minutes like this, it doesn't do very well. After just 20 cycles, you're down to like 70% capacity. So your 300 mile range EV is now a 200 mile range EV. Not acceptable, right? Our uh, multiple lanes approach, our electrode structuring approach, basically has very little degradation. We can cycle this out to 500 times. And you can go even faster. You can go to 10 minute charging rate, which pretty much is meeting our target now. You still have very little degradation where the control is, is really bad at this point. Um, like I said, you can cycle this many, many times. We cycled these about, out to about a thousand cycles. This is just the plot from the paper, but we far exceeded the Department of Energy goal at the time. Um, so we were really excited about this. And keep in mind that 500 cycle mark there for a 300 mile range EV, that's 150,000 miles of driving, so a long way. And that's assuming that it was all fast charging, which nobody is fast charging exclusively. Most people are slow charging most of the time. And then some 10% of the time you're on a road trip, and you need to fast charge. Fast charging is by far the harsher circumstance. So you're going to be above this line in most circumstances, right? So in this case, you can charge in 10 minutes the whole life of your battery, whole life of your car, and the battery is still going to be better off than the car is at the end of that much driving, right? Okay. So then shifting gears now, um, the electrode coating approach. To coat the electrodes, everything up until the coating process was the same. We coated the paint on the slurry, we dried it, and we densified it. We cut out these electrode sheets, and then we did what's called atomic layer deposition, or ALD. I'm not going to go into detail here, but it's a gas phase process. It uses self-limiting half reactions at the surface so that it's not a line of sight process. And we can conformally coat all the way down into the nooks and crannies of this porous electrode. So this is showing one of our graphite particles. It's hard to see on the screen, I apologize. But there's a shell that gets into all of the nooks and crannies of this electrode particle of this solid electrolyte is what it is. It's an ionically conductive ceramic that we're coating this graphite with. But as a result of putting this more ionically conductive coating on these particles, we reduce the resistance that's associated with the SEI, so the purple on this plot. And this is for three different states of charge, 5, 30, and 70%. And in each case, we're reducing it from 17 to 18 ohm centimeter squared down to four. So like a 75% reduction in the resistance associated with this surface layer. And if we take apart the battery right in the middle of a fast charge, you can see that the control has lithium plating on the surface, which we're trying to prevent. And our LBCO, so this is an ALD, lithium borate, lithium carbonate material that we're putting on the surface. We just have gold graphite as we're going, and we're not plating lithium at all. As a result, our cells retain a lot more capacity than the control. The control is in orange in this case, and the ALD is in that, that blue-green. And we can still cycle out to that 500 cycle uh, number while retaining 80% capacity, which is kind of a common failure metric in batteries. All right. So now I'm going to shift gears to, <clears throat> excuse me, to the middle column here and some ways that we can increase energy density in our energy storage. So this is a plot from. 22 years ago now, published in Nature, that compared the energy density on the x-axis and the power density, or excuse me, energy density gravimetrically and energy density volumetrically on the y-axis for a range of different battery chemistries. And lithium ion, which is what we've been talking about so far, is in that blue color um, towards the top. All right. But what I told you about lithium ion specs actually falls up there now. So we're better than we were, right? So they're kind of projections of where we'd get. We're a little bit less optimistic than they could have been, but we're doing pretty good now, right? We're even better than what they call that lithium metal unsafe circle, right? We're doing better than that. But what I'm going to talk about here is actually we have batteries up here now that we can make, and there's prototype batteries in cars today, not cars you can buy, but automotive makers have them, 
that are all the way up there. And notice I've put the word, word safe in there. Can we enable that safely, right? Because there's a reason they said unsafe here, right? So we're gonna explore why that is, right? We want to get up here because this would be a game changer for a lot of different applications, right? But lithium metal is hard to work with, right? Lithium metal is extremely reactive, I mentioned that. There's this other nasty habit that it doesn't like to plate out uniformly. So if you're trying to plate lithium metal with a lithium metal electrode, it's gonna plate out in these dendritic structures like this really high surface area. And then when you try to discharge, get that lithium back, you can't get it all. It forms this dead lithium again, the same stuff that I talked about on graphite. And then the surface gets roughened and then grow it just, ah, it's bad, right? Not to mention the fact that that liquid electrolyte that's in there is extremely flammable. So if you have a reactive something with a uh, flammable something, storing a lot of energy, bad things can happen when things go wrong, right? This is not a lithium metal battery. This was a Tesla, this was a lithium ion battery. And there was a short circuit, not in the car or the battery, but in the charger. And that caused this. So if we're going to something that holds 10 times the energy in the same space, potentially, more like two or three times practically, but um, we need to make sure it's safe, all right? So how can we do that? Well, I said the flammable liquid was the problem. So what if we got rid of the flammable liquid, right? That would solve the problem. But the question is, how can we do that? Can we use a non-flammable solid electrolyte instead of that flammable liquid? Because if it's a solid, then maybe we can plate lithium at that interface in a planar fashion, not that high surface area, really reactive uh, dendritic structure. Because if we can do that, we're going to have dramatically improved safety improved cycle life of a lithium metal battery. We're gonna have higher energy density than any lithium ion battery can offer. And there's also pack level benefits that I wanna mention. One being this solid electrolyte is high temperature stable. So unlike a normal lithium ion battery, you don't have to expend the energy and cost as much with a thermal management system, which is a significant fraction of the cost of a battery pack today is just making sure it doesn't get too hot when you charge it or discharge it. And the packaging could potentially be significantly simpler. Uh, you don't need um, liquid seals and, and things like that. Um, not to mention that it's, it's safer, right? We can enable this lithium metal. So can we do this? Well, maybe. Some aspects we've got it pretty well figured out at this point. We've spent the last decade plus developing a lot of really fancy materials that can do a lot of the things that solid electrolytes need to do. Um, the interfaces between those fancy materials become a little bit trickier, how to enable fast charging and fast discharging. Low temper temperature operation is tricky, whether that's tricky in lithium ion batteries as well. Um, but where, where we're at, I would say, in terms of technological development at this point, is can we do all of those things and make a million of them. That's really hard to do. Can we get really high quality interfaces the same way that maybe we can in the lab, but when we're making a million electric vehicles with these things? And can we do that at an affordable uh, price? All right, so just briefly, this is covering a decade plus of research in one slide, none of which I did, so I don't wanna take credit for this, but solid electrolytes, materials have been developed for several decades, but in the last 13 years now, we've developed several new materials that now can meet or exceed actually the ionic conductivity. So the liquid electrolyte we're talking about is here, this organic electrolyte. So now some of these solid electrolyte materials are actually above the liquid electrolyte. So Ionic conductivity is one requirement. The ions need to be able to move through it. It's not the only requirement, but it's a really important one. Um, and there's several different classes of materials that meet these criteria. And each class of material has its own advantages and disadvantages. This is just kind of a, a spider plot to summarize some of those advantages and disadvantages. And I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but you have um, everything from oxide ceramics, this garnets down here, to polymers, to sulfide materials, perovskites. It's not important what 
each of these materials is. But I think the interesting piece here is that it's not settled in the community or in industry, which of these is going to be the best, right? We have each material has their own advantages and disadvantages. Polymers is really processable, but they don't have a very high elastic module list. They don't have as high of an ion conductivity. Whereas maybe garnets, really good, really good stability, but lower conductivity different things. And as a result, different major players in the battery space have made different major bets on different material systems. So as a material scientist, this is really cool to me, whereas a lot of other materials systems or technologies like lithium ion batteries, there's very little diversity in what's going on inside under the hood. Whereas at this point in solid state batteries, nobody knows which of these is going to be the winner. And there's, there's a lot of investment going on in these spaces. The work that I've done in this area, I'm not gonna go into detail, but is to understand these challenges at interfaces. And one of the main challenges is when you try to charge too fast, remember that picture I said, the solid was gonna make it flat, planar. That doesn't happen in actuality if you charge too fast. The lithium, even though it's soft, like chewing gum kind of, because you're plating it out, it can get into the cracks, kind of like a plant growing through concrete, right? It can get into the cracks and then expand and it, and it can grow even through a very rigid ceramic solid electrolyte and lithium can propagate from one side to the other and short circuit the cell. Now, maybe it doesn't have the catastrophic consequences of a, a very bad fire because it's a non-flammable electrolyte now, but this still kills your battery. So we need to prevent this from happening. This is during uh, discharge instead of charging. You can lose contact between your planar lithium electrode and your solid electrolyte here. You get these big voids which decreases your interfacial area and causes all kinds of problems. But the good news is at least if you believe press releases, some of the big companies say that they've pretty much figured this problem out. Um, of course, there's always room for improvement, but this is a, an example from a company called QuantumScape, Volkswagen, and others have poured billions of dollars into this startup company. Um, but it's because they have a solid state battery that can charge in less than 15 minutes to 80%. So over here on the left side, we're going from 0% state of charge up to 80% state of charge in 15 minutes. This is compared to kind of state of the art uh, Tesla battery essentially, what that can do 40 minutes. And then we can do that, we can cycle it 800 times here. So this is by some metrics, the most exciting solid state battery uh, performance metrics that are out there. There are other big companies. Uh, Solid Power has associated itself with BMW and Ford, pouring billions of dollars into that. So it's possible. One pig can fly, but can we make them all fly is the problem at this point. Can we scale it up? And then the, the dirty little secret here is that this isn't an all-solid state battery, actually. They had to, to put a little bit of a liquid gel on the cathode side to make the interface play nice. Um, so the safety implications of that are yet to be seen. So I wanna wrap this section up just by saying, this is happening. Electric vehicles are ramping up at a, a really rapid rate and pretty much all, so this is the top five uh, automotive companies in the world, um, not including Tesla, which is an all EV maker, so I didn't include it, but, um, many billions of dollars being poured into EVs and specifically solid state batteries in a lot of cases. And we'll start to see the rollout of solid state batteries in cars that you can actually buy. According to the earliest, uh, Toyota's planning on putting it in the Prius actually first in 2025. Um, rollout in all, all EV shortly thereafter. And some of the other major automakers, including that QuantumScape battery is 2026. Um, so just a few, a few years out now, so exciting stuff. All right, so now I'm gonna switch gears towards grid storage. That was all transportation. But at the very beginning, I said we also need energy storage in the grid to allow us to use more and more intermittent renewables. Currently we store energy in the grid predominantly with pumped storage hydroelectric. We pump water up a hill and we have extra electricity and we let it flow back down through a turbine when we need extra generation capacity. The capacity of this storage is roughly about 2% of the overall general generation capacity. 
but we really haven't built any new pump storage hydroelectric in a, quite a while because it's geographically constrained. You need two bodies of the water at the top and bottom of a large hill. That doesn't exist everywhere, especially everywhere that water isn't scarce. Um, so this is really plateaued. So now we need to start looking at what's the other stuff in this little sliver. And there's various different kinds of batteries, including lithium ion. This is an old pie chart. It's not up to date at this point, but I just wanted to show kind of the spread of things. There's also uh, mechanical storage like flywheels. There's compressed air where you pump air underground in large caverns and then let that compressed air flow out through turbines when you need it. Um, various different options. But in recent years, uh, lithium ion batteries have really started to dominate this grid storage uh, application uh, for better or worse. And if we, so this was up to 2018, you see this start of this crazy uptick, exponential increase that this starts at 2017 and we're going to 2022, it's just continuing, right? This exponential increase, 18 fold increase in five years, really fast growth, right? And in addition to additional capacity, the way we're using this energy storage capability on the grid is changing. To start out, we were mostly using it for frequency regulation. So small amounts of energy, short discharge times. Just when, so when you move to solar in particular, you no longer have the inertia of a rotating uh, generator that regulates your frequency for small little changes in demand and supply. So if you don't have that, you need energy storage that you can turn on and off really fast. That's mostly what it was being used for pre 2017, but as this implementation has exploded, we've started using it both to shift supply from when energy is cheap to when energy is expensive, price arbitrage, but also to store excess wind and solar. Um, but these different categories of how you use grid storage are important because each one has a different time scale associated with it. So if you're going to store energy for frequency regulation, your discharge time is super short, and that's a generally pretty high value uh, way to use your energy storage. Whereas if you're trying to use a, a energy storage system in a way where you only charge and discharge it once a year, that's a really low value application, right? But what's becoming increasingly clear is that we need longer duration energy storage. This is huge push from the federal government because they've identified that if we want to go anywhere close to a net zero energy system, we need massive amounts of storage capacity on our grid. Regardless of how much the batteries are gonna cost, you're gonna have huge amounts of energy storage on the grid. And I say batteries, I mean any way that we can possibly store energy. Um, we're gonna need huge amounts. And a lot of it is going to be in this, you know, 10 hour, that B row there, or longer, maybe multi-day, it's a hundred hour time scale. Um, categories. We need these longer duration systems. And when we go to this, right, this is thousands of gigawatt hours, so terawatt hours, enormous scale. And that's the concerning thing here is we need huge storage capacity, including long duration. And currently we're just shoehorning lithium ion batteries into that application where lithium is a relatively scarce material. I mean, there's a lot of it, but when you start to go to this scale, it becomes problematic both for price and environmental impact of extracting those resources. And lithium ion batteries are really limited to four hour discharge time. Beyond that, they get really economically not viable. So in order to do so at a reasonable cost, we really need to consider how available are the resources that are needed to go into these energy storage systems. And the best way I know to do that is look at, well, just how much of it is there in the Earth's crust. Right, that's the first, first order approximation for how easy things are to access. You can look, uh, lithium's here, right? So it's not up in the most common elements. And the other thing I wanna point out here is that once we go to these scales and these longer time durations, batteries or energy storage systems that we call batteries might not look very much like lithium ion batteries or the batteries that have come before. And one of the things that I mean by that is in some cases, instead of having a solid electrode, right, or those particles that we painted on, in a flow battery, we have liquid electrodes, right, or catholite and anolite is a 
is another term for them. But in this case, a big advantage of a flow battery where you have essentially two liquid electrodes that you're circulating past a membrane in the middle and you're shifting these two electrodes. In some cases, it's little particles. In other cases, it's just dissolved molecules. But you're shifting them between different oxidation states and you can store energy and get energy back in that way. But the nice thing here is that power, how fast you can access it, that energy, and the amount of energy you store are completely decoupled. The amount of energy you store, remember, was the size of the tank of water. So it's still the size of the tank of electrode here. And the power is associated with the area of that membrane. So now we can make flow batteries. This is an actual battery in China now. Um, that's 400 megawatt hours. It's a, a demonstration there. Absolutely enormous. So building size tanks of uh, flow battery electrodes in this case. So this technology works. This one uses vanadium because vanadium has four different oxidation states that are pretty easily accessed. You can switch one side between five and four and one side between three and two plus states. The problem with vanadium though is it's expensive. There's not a lot of it. It wasn't up in that earth abundant uh, category. It's about on par with like copper roughly. So before vanadium redox flow batteries were a thing, maybe you could get, so this is uh, dollars per kilowatt hour. Remember lithium ion was about a hundred, right? But now we're getting volatile and that's just the electrode. That's not the balance of plant. That's not anything else. Um, so vanadium, unfortunately, probably a no-go at the, at the scale that we need, in my opinion, at least. So we need alternatives. There's a lot of work being done in organic molecules for this, where you don't need transition metals that are hard to mine and things like that. There's a lot of exciting progress there. I'm not an expert in that. But I think that's a really exciting direction. Um, and then the last kind of content slide here that I'm gonna talk about is this one, where instead of a flow battery, now we have a metal air battery. And metal air batteries, it's, I think about it as a controlled oxidation or controlled corrosion process. So one of the most um, mature technologies in this space is from a company called Form Energy. And they're in the process of building a demonstration scale plant in Minnesota that's gonna be 150 megawatt hours. And that's designed to operate in the 100 to 150 hour discharge range. So now we're shifting energy from one part of a week to another part of a week, right? If it's rainy for a few days and cloudy and you don't have uh, much solar being generated, you can discharge that battery for a few days, all right? And in that case, you're taking metallic iron, I think a cast iron pan that you've left water on, right? And it rusts, right? That, that's an exothermic process or it, it's energetically downhill. So we can do that electrochemically, separate out the half reactions and get electricity out of that. The trick here is how can we drive that backwards, right? How can we undo that rusting process? And it's, as you might imagine, not particularly easy. It's one of the biggest challenges of any of these metal air technologies is how can we apply a voltage that's not enormous and drive that reaction backwards? So the kind of challenges that are remaining for these metal air batteries, as I see it, is one thing, energy efficiency, right? I said, you have to apply a large voltage to drive that backwards. So that's lost energy in the system. It's hard to get exact numbers, but for this form energy one, I think they're in like 70 to 80%, but don't quote me on that. Um, energy efficiency, so not as good as lithium ion, but better than a lot of things. Um, and then how many times can you cycle it? The vanadium redox flow, one of the nice things is you can cycle it a really long time, thousands and thousands of cycles. And even at the end, often all you have to do is transfer a little bit of electro, electrode liquid from one side to the other and then recharge and you're good to go. Um, but here, cycle life and reversibility is a major challenge. So some key takeaways here. I wanna leave as much time as possible for questions, but energy storage is important. There's still ongoing advances in materials and engineering uh, at the interfaces between materials and batteries that will continue to offer improved performance, things like charging rate, life, time, and safety. We really need to accelerate the shift away from lithium-based batteries for stationary applications. We need to save that lithium for where it makes the most sense, in my opinion, right? Lithium is a finite resource. We need to use it wisely. Um, and we need to make sure we're recycling all of it when those vehicles come to end of life. So as we're developing these new technologies, we need to make sure they're earth abundant, non-toxic, all of these different things so that we don't have setbacks down the road. 
And I want to emphasize, I talked a lot about batteries today. I did a lot of work on lithium. I don't think those are the only parts of the solution here. I think uh, biofuels and renewable fuels have a big role to play. Fuel cells, et cetera, all have roles to play in different technological areas. Um, yeah, with that, I'd like to thank uh, the people that contributed to this funding and, and open the floor for questions. Kind of going off that point. And asked about uh, and is a possible way of working. Yeah, so the question is, can is thermal storage essentially heating sand was the question a way for storing energy for the grid? And absolutely. So all the storage technologies I talked about today were supply side uh, storage. And you can use thermal storage on the supply side, but where I think it's maybe even more exciting is demand side uh, storage. So that means this building, right, maybe it has a solar array or it, it has some needs to cool and heat itself, right, at very, various different times of the year. So if you integrate thermal storage, right, you can heat sand or a molten salt or something like that when energy is cheap or when you're generating electricity from renewable sources and then use that when energy is expensive to heat your building instead of running a heat pump with the electricity, right, um, all the time. So what that does is, first of all, it, it lowers your bill in a lot of cases because you can use electricity when it's cheap, but also it reduces the overall supply that we need for electricity, right? It reduces that peak demand on the grid, which makes all energy generation cheaper, essentially, because that last little bit of peak demand is extremely expensive um, to cover. It's one of the reasons why energy storage is, is really valuable right now. Um, is to cover that peak demand. But yeah, thermal storage is another uh, big area. Um, just in our department, we also hired a thermal energy storage uh, faculty member this year. So it's, it's energy storage is a big push on campus. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you, you saw that price curve, right? What's that? Oh, yes, sorry. The question was about, I, I had mentioned that lithium ion batteries are being shoehorned into for grid storage applications and why that's the case. Are there no alternatives or is there something else going on? So one thing is yes, other uh, technologies are not as mature in terms of electrochemical energy storage. One thing that I'll point out is these demonstration scale things. So the, for form energy, that 150 megawatt hour plant that's going in in Minnesota, that's absolutely critical because right now, even if there are better options, right, you can look at the specs and say, all right, this is better than lithium ion battery, right? It's cheaper, it lasts longer, less, it's less likely to have a fire, right? So a lot of these giant lithium ion battery facilities have had fires not long after they've been installed, which is, um, it's not an enormous problem from the technological implementation, but it's a really big PR problem. Um, and you have to design your plant such that one module doesn't touch the other one. And there's a lot of considerations there. But um, anyway, the banks that finance these large energy storage uh, facilities are not willing to finance risky technologies, right? And if you don't have a demonstration plant that's been operating for five years or 10 years, to show that it's gonna work long-term, very few people are going to be winning, willing to put in that risk, right? So you need these the early entries into the system to demonstrate value and long-term performance. So I think we're approaching a tipping point for a lot of these technologies because you are seeing these grid scale implementations that'll prove or disprove uh, functionality. But um, I think there's a lot of promising technologies. So it's an exciting time. Online here. Do you see any alternatives on the horizon for the? So yes, um, there's a lot of diversity in the vehicle market, right? You have everything from several hundred thousand dollar cars all the way down to very inexpensive cars, and several companies are rolling out sodium ion alternatives for EV applications. Um, it's mostly starting in uh, Asia. 
for now because the use case for EVs is different. The ownership model in some cases looks different. In this country, we'd like to own outright our vehicles. In other, in other countries, that's less common. Um, and in some cases, they're willing to accept a much smaller range than most people in this country are. Um, so yeah, sodium ion is, is making an entrance because of the low cost price point. And I, it's, it's great because sodium is extremely earth abundant, right? The ocean is high concentration of sodium, right? It's cheap to make as well. And maybe sort of a similar question. Um, has there been significant lower energy um, that makes a smaller range but faster charging? Uh, yes, there, there's most questions like that. The answer is yes, it's been looked into. You can do that in a number of ways. First of all, you can just make your electrodes thinner. That's one way to increase power density at the, at the expense of energy density, right? That makes the ions easier to get in and out of the electrodes. You can also make the particles smaller. You can go to other materials. So lithium iron phosphate is something that I didn't talk about a lot, um, but it's, it's been around for a long time. It's a very robust chemistry. It's not quite as high energy density as the <clears throat> kind of I don't know, highest energy density lithium ion batteries today that are uh, some composition of NMC, so nickel, manganese, cobalt oxide, or NCA, nickel, cobalt, aluminum oxide. That's what Tesla uses in their high energy density batteries. Um, so LFP is lower energy density than those but it also doesn't use the nickel and the cobalt that are so problematic from a supply chain standpoint. So um, even Tesla for their Model 3, their lower cost price point is going to LFP for those batteries, um, which is also good to see. You're still using lithium, lithium is still problematic, but you get rid of some of the other even more problematic metals, nickel and the cobalt. Cobalt especially, we really need to move away from. Um, it has some really significant environmental and social justice concerns behind the supply chain. What is that limit? Four hours. Yeah, it's a difficult thing to think about because. Oh yes, I'm terrible at that. Um, the question was about what, why metal air batteries can address a longer duration storage uh, niche than lithium ion batteries. And it all comes down to cost. What's the value proposition? It's not that you can't discharge a lithium ion battery that slowly. Of course you can, right? The lithium ion battery in a watch can last a long time, right? You can, but you're not utilizing that investment up to its full potential, right? So it doesn't make economic sense to do it. Whereas a metal air battery, it can't go faster. <laughs> so that then, it maximizes its value at that long duration. And they, I shouldn't say it can't go faster. They're designing that plant for that market because they've done a lot of analysis and figured out that that's the highest value niche that they can fill that nobody else can fill. Um, they can design their electrode architecture differently to access a different time duration. They're, not gonna, they're never gonna be super fast, um, but they can go a little bit faster um, if they need to. So it really just comes down to uh, cost. And the reason, I guess one of the reasons that metal air batteries fit better in that longer duration is the kinetics are just slow. It's really hard to drive things faster. I mentioned you have to put more energy in than you're getting out. Um, if you try to go much faster than that, you're, you're really cutting into your energy efficiency. So the question is about the electrode structuring approach to fast charging. And I believe the question is, does it also help during discharging? Yes, it absolutely does. And I, one other thing that I didn't mention, so the two approaches that I talked about, electrode structuring and easy pass, the, ionic, uh, the ionically conductive coating, we haven't published it yet, but they combine really, really well. They work synergistically together. They address different parts of the problem. 
And if you put them together, they, it's really exciting results. Um, you can fast charge at low temperature, you can do all, all kinds of stuff, but it's not published, so I can't really talk too much about it. How I do the visualization. So the question is about um, how I go about visualizing inside the battery, right? So it varies for different uh, cases. Solid state batteries are a different animal than the liquid. I'm gonna see if I have a slide here. I don't seem to. Okay, it's a good question though. Essentially it comes down to how can we incorporate, in most cases I'm doing optical, characterization. So I'm using a microscope or camera um, to look inside the battery. So how can I get optical access without fundamentally altering the way that the cell is operating, right? So we take really uh, close care to not modify electric field distribution and the stack pressure and things like that because those things fundamentally alter the way the battery operates. And if we want, under, want to understand the origin of these problems, we need to make sure that we're operating in a, in a representative way, right? There's not a ton to it beyond that. It's, it's a lot of practical considerations of how do you build a cell that when you zoom in, looks a lot like a regular battery, but you zoom out and it has different seals in a very different way. It has a transparent window. Often we use either quartz or sapphire for that window. Um, you know, enable, in engineering it in a way that still has good electrical contact so we can do various advanced electrochemical characterization while we're visualizing, things like that. Does that help? I'd be happy to show you more offline. I just don't have a slide here. Uh, ready. Are you able to take, there's one more thing online, uh, just generally asking about the code. I don't have much to say, but cadmium is one of the nastiest things out there in terms of like toxicity and health impact. So it, we don't wanna be using NICAD batteries. Uh, nickel metal hydroxide have a role to play. There's a reason why uh, Toyota kept nickel metal hydroxide batteries in Toyota Priuses until 2020, something around there, right? Way after there were lithium ion based EVs, Toyota was still using nickel metal hydride because it just works. It's, it's not the highest energy density, but you can cycle it thousands of times. It's aqueous, so it's safe. I mean, it, it just works. Um, so that maybe has a role play, but I can. Yeah, thanks for the invitation.